The first time I felt like I had truly failed at something was in 10th grade, and it was on the quadratics test in Algebra 2. I'm sure a few of you might be familiar. And I actually remember studying and studying for that exam. I even used the textbook to do practice problems. Uh, but when the test was finally in front of me, I had no clue what to do with the mixture of letters and numbers and just like evil little twos in front of me. To be honest, my parabola that day looked a little bit more like that. And so, and so I had never really not succeeded so badly at something and I didn't know how to take it. This was kind of around the time when like everyone in high school starts to merge off into different groups and you have to find your new place, but I hadn't found mine yet. So all I felt like I had was my academics and I wasn't succeeding at that. So what did I have? But looking back, I'm glad I got a 48 on that exam because it made me stronger. And anyways, failure is inevitable. So if it didn't happen to me then, it would happen to me now with much higher stakes or in the future. I'm so lucky that I've had this experience in high school before I got out into the real world. For example, this year I applied to college. I was a little bit ambitious with several of my applications and I even applied to Stanford University, from which I was promptly rejected, I'll be real. Um, but even so, like, I learned how to deal with that. I learned how to accept that I'm going to a school that will suit me and in the end, it's going to turn out okay. Since this failure was such a valuable experience for me, and a familiar experience to everyone else, I wanted to share with you guys the steps of becoming comfortable with failure. Because this is something that we don't talk about enough, yet everyone needs to know it. So I like to begin at the beginning, and step one in this process is to fail. So like I said, it's uh, inevitable, so please don't do this on purpose. Uh, you don't have to do it intentionally, it'll happen at some point. But I like to think of this as a step because you can, it's kind of a, it feels like a step back, but yet you're still moving forward in the process without even having done much yet. And then the second step gets a little bit more complicated because it deals with the emotional shock of failure. And basically, you have to get over it. There's actually a lot more that goes into this step than you think. And for me, uh, crying helps. So after I failed my exam, I went into the bathroom and cried all of the following lunch period. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. But there's also actual research that shows that crying is good for you. We've all read the generic stuff, like it secretes certain hormones that will relieve your stress. But I read an academic journal from the Association of Psychological Science, and it said that crying depends on the environment and the person. So the benefits are, are more easy to see if the person is crying in a homey, intimate environment. They looked at all these different uh, studies and experiments, and the ones that were done in a lab were not as beneficial to the subjects. Uh, the unfamiliar environment tended to worsen their stress after crying. So you want to find a place where you're comfortable, like at home. And then if you're secure in your emotions, the benefits are also obvi more obvious in this. Um, so if you feel comfortable with crying and you feel comfortable with that emotional vulnerability, you know, it helps if you're alone for this part. But that's good. And so, um, but this isn't for everyone. Crying isn't something that's easy for everyone to go into and admit that they're emotionally vulnerable. So you might want to find something else that will help you purge your emotions. You know, if it's talking to someone with like a trusted friend or a therapist, or you can work it out physically if you just don't want to admit that kind of emotional vulnerability, you can go to the gym and work out. But it's okay, you just need to find something that you can fall back on throughout this process that will make you feel better when you're feeling emotional about your failure. Now, as you're going through this process, it might take some trial and error to find that thing, but that's okay because this is a long process. As you're going up these steps, it's likely that you're going to fall again, but even though you fail, you cannot think of yourself as a failure, and that's step three. You have to dissociate your identity from your failure. So you have to know that even though you failed, it does not make you a failure. And in truth, I included this step in the process because it was what a bunch of random articles on the internet said. 
I didn't even re realize that I had reached this conclusion in my own mentality until my teacher specifically asked me, Claire, how did you reach this conclusion? And then I had to think about it. And I thought about how ridiculous it was and how long I had let myself believe that I was a failure as a person and as a student in every subject just because of one misstep in my education. So long after this test, I had felt like I wasn't really good at math. I made a feeble attempt to salvage my grade for the rest of the semester, and I saw my lack of motivation as a lack of aptitude. And that just wasn't true. That wasn't the real situation I was in. And also, it spread to other areas of my life. I believe that I wasn't a good writer for a while. And some of you don't really understand the magnitude of that statement, because you might not know me. But let me put it into context. From the time I was writing sentences in crayon through the seventh grade, I wanted nothing in my life but to be a writer, because language is the one thing that has come naturally to me in my life. I, as soon as I was speaking words, I could speak the sentence, doggy go woof. I was putting sentences together when I was little so fast, because language is something natural for me. I learned to read fast. I learned how to write stories fast. I, was, I had this giant bin in my closet filled to the brim with, it was over, actually overflowing with composition books and journals filled with gel pen stories that I would love to write. And I just wanted nothing but to be a writer. Even though, even though I failed on this test, I was still a good writer. And I didn't let myself realize that. Because I had failed this test, I thought I wasn't a good writer or a good student in general. I thought I wasn't good. And that's just not what was really happening. And so that's why you can see how toxic failure can, be, can become if we let it become that, if we let it spread to the other areas of our life. Now, step four is perseverance. And I think this is the most involved step in the process because there's so many layers that goes into this. You have to gain perspective and you have to figure out what you want. So for the gaining perspective part, I think this is really important because looking, of course, now I look back and I think that test was a good experience for me, but for the rest of the semester, I was actually bitter about my grade and how low it was and how bad I had done on that test and how it was affecting everything else I did in that class because math is cumulative, as we all know. And so in order to gain perspective early on, you can ask yourself some questions. So what I like to ask is, oh, yeah. So <laughs> it's really easy to think that you're making really big strides in your life, but you are actually just on your way to tripping over a log and falling on your face. But like I said, you have to gain perspective because this is actually part of a long journey. It's just a little snap, or a snafu, you would, as one would say. So for gaining perspective, I like to ask, in five years, will this failure still be affecting me? And the answer might be yes, because hopefully you can learn from it and grow. But if the answer is no, then you can ask yourself, what was I so worried about? It's going to be OK. Everything will turn out all right. And you can take comfort in that fact. And you can also take comfort if the answer is yes and the fact that you're going to get something out of this in the end. And so in addition to this, to gaining perspective, you have to look at the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, the metaphorical light at the end of the tunnel. We've all heard of it. But it's hard to look at it if the light doesn't match what you really want or if it's not there at all in many cases. So you have to figure that out. So in order to do this, let me ask you a question. When you hear the phrase successful man or she's a successful woman, what do you visualize? Is it a CEO sitting in a high rise? Is it someone who's very wealthy, has a big home? Is it a doctor or a lawyer? These people are successful in their own lives, but it doesn't mean success for everyone. You have to think outside of the box for this part. My mother is one of the most successful people I know. She raised three children. She is national board certified in her profession, which she has been doing for over 20 years. And she's not a doctor. She's not a lawyer. She's not a CEO. 
She's a classroom teacher. Her success is her students' growth and her students' success. And let me tell you, she gets all of these Facebook friend requests from her uh, former students, and she's always so happy to find out that they have a stable job and they have fulfilled lives and they're happy and they have kids and they've just grown up so much. And it makes her so immensely proud and it makes her feel fulfilled. That's her success. So when you start, stop asking yourself, what is success? And instead ask, what is success for me? You can finally start to gain perspective on the issue and persevere. You can begin to build goals toward what you want. And that will help you climb up these steps of becoming comfortable with failure. Because you know that in the end, there's something that you want and you're going to get it. Because failure creates this kind of rut for, for us that makes it hard to go up. But, you know, I like to think that rock bottom is good because there's nowhere to go but up. And once you ask this question and once you find that up, you'll be unstoppable. And so that's all in the long run. But what do you do in the meantime? Step five is the generic advice, but it's to identify what went wrong and change something. And this is, like I said, everyone says this, but it's actually such an important part. You have to figure out what happened to make you fail, and you have to make sure that it doesn't happen again. You have to change something. You have to modify what you did. And in order to do this, you have to look what you did in the face. If you didn't do well at a job interview, then you can look at your resume, see if there's anything that you can tweak about it, see if there's anything you might want to add or take away that might be subtracting from uh, your qualities and your qualifications. And if something that you thought went well actually went wrong, then that's why when you can ask a witness, ask someone who was there. I didn't ever ask my teacher if uh, there was anything I could have done, if I should have gone to tutorials more, which obviously I should have, if I should have participated in class more, if there's something I should have done, if there was a specific part in the book that, that I needed to be looking at, I never asked. And that would have been so helpful for the rest of the semester and for the rest of the year. And maybe it would have helped my GPA overall at the end of my four years of high school. And so in real life application, you know, you can always ask, you know, your job interviewer and you can say, hey, I know you didn't offer me this job, but I just wanted to know what is it that you didn't like about me? Was it a certain way I answered a question? Was it something on my resume? And then they'll tell you. You can always call back. They'll be happy to tell you and let you know. Because first, it comes off as impressive if you ever want to reapply to that company. And secondly, um, you'll have that information for when you do other job applications in the future as you continue your search. So in the end, I didn't actually deal with my failure on this Algebra 2 test well. I know it's a shocker because I'm standing up in front of all of you and telling you how to deal with failure, but it's true. I was angry at my teacher because I thought that he didn't teach me when he was really just trying to help the entire time. I was angry at myself for letting me down. I was just angry in general and I was upset. I didn't know how to take it. But, you know, it, it's so good that this happened to me because failure is good. Why do we think of it as a bad thing? Failure means becoming stronger. It means rising up. It means kicking butt. It means growing wiser and it means growing and it means becoming you. And that is so special. Something like that we need to harness into our daily lives and we cannot take it for granted. Thank you.